Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming and uh, worshiping with us this morning. If you've got a Bible, you can turn it to John chapter 2. We are going to do what we do every week, and we're going to open God's Word, and we're going to study it. We're going to expect that we can hear from God, the living God of heaven and earth, because he speaks still today through his word. And we're going through uh, the entire book of John in a series that we are calling Life in His Name. John told us in his gospel that he wrote at the very end, he said, the reason I'm writing this to you is so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ and that in believing you will have life in his name. So John is writing a biography, he's trying to compile a portrait, he's trying to build up evidence that will convince you, the reader, that Jesus is who he said he is, that he's the divine son of God, that he's the word made flesh, and that through believing in his name, through faith in Jesus, you can experience eternal life. And today, we are going to stumble upon Jesus, we're going to watch Jesus show up to a party where they have run out of provisions, and Jesus is going to make a way, and this message, for better or for worse, is called Cabernet in Cana. So you got to deal with that one. It's called Cabernet in Cana. Um, There is no archaeological evidence to suggest that it was actually a Cabernet that he made. We just went with this title because we wanted to have some fun in church this morning. We also thought about Merlot for the marriage and Pinot at the party, but we settled on Cabernet in Cana, okay? So that's what you got. Write it down in your journal, jot it down in your phone, and get ready at John chapter 2, and I will meet you there in just a minute. I love documentary films, and mostly I love documentary films because they feed my desire to have a vast repository of useless information in my head. I love being the guy who knows something, like who knows a useless factotum that doesn't matter in anybody's life, but I watched a documentary on it like a long time ago, and so I've got it like at the drop of a hat, and documentaries kind of help me do that. There are some documentaries that are made specifically to produce a change in your life. So the goal of these documentaries is that you would watch them, and in watching them, you would be convinced that you need to change something. You need to change something that you believe, or something that you do, or a way that you think. They're kind of like these activist documentaries. Consider a couple really famous ones. There's one called Blackfish that won all kinds of awards, and it's about the abuse of orca whales in captivity. And the change that it is intended to make is that you would never go to SeaWorld again. You're supposed to, you're supposed to villainize and demonize SeaWorld for their evil in the way that they treat orcas. There's another one called Supersize Me that's all about the effects of fast food as, a, as a, a solitary diet on the human body. And that one is designed to make you not go to McDonald's. You're supposed to watch that, be disgusted by McDonald's, and not want to go. And then there's one called Making a Murderer that's about this botched murder trial. And I think that one's designed to make you not want to go to Wisconsin. But I'm, I'm not sure. I just think that's what they're trying to say. You watch the people in the documentary and you're like, I do not want to be friends with these people. I do not want to be around these people. I don't want to be in the same county as them. You watch the documentary and you're supposed to be convinced that something needs to change. If the documentary is doing its job, you will behave differently. I wonder, as we come to John chapter 2 and we're going to look at Jesus, I wonder if we could stop and consider the question, what's supposed to change if we see Jesus? What's supposed, to, what's supposed to change about our lives when we see who Jesus is and what Jesus can do? I think most of us, if we're being honest, there are times in our lives where we look at Jesus and we treat Jesus the same way we treat one of these documentaries. Like, I know there's a bunch of you that a while ago you watched Supersize Me and then it was like five minutes later, you're like, let's go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac. <laughs> You just completely disregarded the intended effect of the documentary and you, you kind of shrugged your shoulders like that's interesting but it doesn't really matter to my life and you just carried on with business as usual. We're in danger if we do that with Jesus. If we look at Jesus and his power and his presence and his ministry and his teaching and we kind of shrug our shoulders and walk away unaffected, we have missed the design of God in writing this gospel for us. God intends that we would see the glory of the power of Jesus and not that some things around our lives or in our lives would change, but that our lives themselves would change. 
that we would be completely overhauled from the inside out, that we would be renovated by the glory that we have beheld and we would be changed to look more like it. And that's what we're gonna see in the big idea today. We're gonna see this. For those who recognize the glory of Jesus' power, life changes. For those who recognize the glory of Jesus' power, life changes. We're gonna begin today to bear witness through John's pen to the miraculous ability of the word who was made flesh, of Jesus. And as we see it, we are gonna be we're going to be confronted with the reality that our lives should change because of what we see. Not at a superficial level, not at a circumstantial level, but at a very deep internal level. Our desires and our affections and our priorities and our perspectives, they should be completely altered by beholding the glorious power of Jesus. So let's read together this episode of Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana, starting in John chapter two and verse one. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Verse six. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, he and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. For those who recognize the glory of Jesus' power, life changes. And the question we're going to ask and answer from the passage today is, what changes when I see the glory of Jesus' power? If I recognize the glorious power of Jesus for what it is, then how will that affect my life? And we're going to see three consequences of recognizing the glorious power in the form of life change. We're going to see three life changes in the passage that we see modeled from these characters that we read about. And the first life change is this. His authority shapes my priorities. His authority shapes my priorities. Go back to verse one. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Cana was a very small town and it was a neighboring town to Nazareth. So it, it's not a surprise that Jesus and his family and his new followers who he picked up last week in John chapter one, they get invited to be guests at this wedding in the, neighbor, in the neighboring town. But it's a, it's a small wedding. So Jesus and his mom and his followers, they go to the wedding to attend as guests. And apparently Mary is a little bit more involved than just a normal guest because she seems to have some insider access. Maybe she's the kind of friend that you asked to help with your wedding because she's like, she must be on the catering team because no, she knows there's a food and beverage problem before anyone else does. She's privy to the problem of the fact that the wine ran out and we're gonna talk about what a serious problem that was in just a minute. But she knows about it and then she takes it to Jesus to tell him what happened. A lot of biblical scholars think that when Jesus was at this point in his life, when he's about to begin his earthly ministry, that his earthly father, Joseph, had already passed away and that his mom, Mary, was a widow. 
If you read the Gospels, there's really no mention of Joseph in the adult stories of Jesus. So chances are he had already passed away. Mary's a widow. So she goes to Jesus as the man of the house, and she brings her problem to him, hoping and trusting that he's going to be able to do something about it. It says in verse 3, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, in just a minute, Jesus is going to respond with a rebuke. He's going to gently and lovingly rebuke Mary for what she says here. But I want to understand kind of what she's doing a little bit uh, before we get to that rebuke. You, you guys know, right, that moms can issue a command without issuing a command. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You must not have a mom. Uh, she, she walks into your room and she says, oh, I see you haven't cleaned your room. That's a command without a command. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) She's telling you what to do, and she didn't even have to tell you what to do. And this is what's happening here with Jesus. She goes to Jesus, and she says, they have no wine. And implied in that is Jesus, do something about it. Can you help? Can you fix this situation? And, And isn't this what moms do? Like, moms, I love you. This is said in love. This is what moms do. And and we need them to do it. Moms, moms kind of like poke and they push and they prod to move people along. And that's good. We need moms to do that. If you're, if you're a young married couple, um, you will know that moms are notorious for pounding down your door for when you're going to give them grandkids. And this is what moms do. They, they, do it, they do it all the time. When Rachel and I were a young married couple, my mom frequently would be like, you know, that room in the back of our house would make a great nursery. You know, I have tons of free time for babysitting. She's like, she's pushing and poking and prodding, trying to, trying to kind of move things down the field, right? That's, that's what moms do. And, and Jesus here is actually receiving that from his mom, and then he's responding to it because he actually needs her to know something very important that is changing about his life. This is why. So he, it's almost as if very gently but very firmly he says, Mom, that, that, that's enough of that. We're not going to do that anymore. And here's, here's why. Here's how he says it. He says, woman, says, and Jesus said to her, woman, generally not an advisable strategy for how to talk to your mom. Don't recommend that one. Jesus says, woman, which is functionally equivalent to our word ma'am. It's not disrespectful. It's not harsh, but it's certainly not like affectionate and familial. It's actually intended to create a little bit of distance between Jesus and his mom right now. So he calls her woman, and then he says, what does this have to do with me? Which is a, it's a Jewish idiom. He's basically saying we are not looking, and th- we're not looking at this situation the same way. We're not thinking about it the same way. There's not common ground between you and me in the way we are thinking about the situation that we are in. And then he says something particularly surprising if you are very familiar with the Gospel of John. He says, my hour has not yet come. If you've read the Gospel of John a bunch of times, you'll know that this phrase is pretty common. It's said eight times in the Gospel of John, and every single time it refers to the death and glorification of Jesus. This consummate moment in the life and ministry of Jesus that his life was heading towards where he would die to pay for sin and then rise from the dead. That's what he calls his hour. And he says here, my hour has not yet come. Now, if you're just reading the story, that's a little bit jarring because Mary's like, hey, Jesus, can you fix the wine? And he's like, it's not time for me to die. And you're like, why are you, (laughs) number one, why are you talking about the hour of your death at the moment that she asked about the wine? And number two, why are you pushing back so hard if you're about to make the wine anyways in a second? Have you ever wondered that? He says to her like, whoa, pump the brakes, slow your roll, but then he does it anyways. Here's why. Mary is saying to Jesus, Mary most likely, probably more likely than anyone else on the earth, had enough information to know that Jesus was unique, that he was special, that he was sent by God for something special. And at this moment, in this wedding, it it appears that she's looking at Jesus and she's saying, now's the time. Now's your time to do something. Like, come on, show them what you got. And Jesus looks at her and says, I am going to do something. And I'm going to do something that is far bigger and far more eternal than you have, you have any idea to even imagine right now. But it's not going to happen right this second. 
Now is not my time. And in fact, right here, he is going to show his miraculous power, but he's going to do it in a bit of an under-the-cover, clandestine kind of way because he doesn't want it to be public yet. He doesn't want all of the notoriety and all of the followership that will come along with him very shortly. Briefly, this is what Jesus is saying to his mom. He is saying, I came to this earth for a messianic mission and no one and nothing, not even my own mom, can tell me how and when to accomplish it. Only God the Father can tell me that. And if you're familiar with Jesus in the Gospels, you'll know he's always saying, I do nothing of my own accord. I obey the Father. I came according to the Father's plan in the Father's will. I obey the Father's law. He's all about obeying his Father. So he says to his mom, until now, like a good son, I have been about my earthly mother's business, but that time is over. And now that my public ministry is beginning, I will be only and ever about my heavenly Father's business. And that's what he's gently and lovingly and firmly telling his mom. Jesus was going to display his power. He ultimately was going to do what Mary is asking for. He's going to teach with authority. He's going to display his miraculous power in public. He's going to demonstrate himself very clearly to be the son of God, the divine word who became flesh. He's going to show all that. Eventually, it's going to lead to his death and to his resurrection. But he's going to do all of it according to his timetable in submission to the Father's will. And Jesus is resolute that nothing will stop him or sway him from doing that. Jesus, as the second member of the Trinity, lived in subordination under the authority of the Father. And now that he has done that, he has authority over all of his people. And Mary, she recognizes that. She recognizes the authority of Jesus in this moment. And she has her priorities adjusted by his authority. And she says to the servants in verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So at this point, she is hopeful that he will do something, but she is leaving it in his hands entirely to decide what he will do and how he will do it. And that is a very valuable lesson for us to learn from Mary. Mary submits in this moment to the authority of Jesus, and she says, look, I know I brought some priorities to the table, but I understand that you are now in authority over me, and so you should shape my authorities with what, or my priorities with what you want. You and I, we are very good at crafting our priorities, at at building what we want our lives to look like and our homes to look like and our futures to look like and crafting how we want everything to work out and then taking all of those priorities to God and foisting them upon him and just saying, hey, if you could get on my page, that'd be really great. And we kind of expect things from God that he never promised to us in the first place because they're our priorities. They are what we want. And here we get this, we should receive a bit of a gentle rebuke just like Mary did, that we would do well to stop bringing our priorities to God and start getting our priorities from God, to start allowing the desires of our lives and the patterns and the habits of our lives to be shaped not by what we want in our flesh, but by what God has revealed in his word. If you recognize the glory of Jesus' power, the first way that your life will change is that you want your priorities to be shaped by him, not by you. You actually lay down your priorities. You lay down your preferences. You lay down your plans and you say, God, I want my life to look like what you want. I want you to be in charge and I want everything in me to be shaped by what you want. This is what, in a small way, Mary shows us here. Do whatever he tells you. It's the first way your life will change if you see the glorious power of Jesus. And the second way your life will change is this. His extraordinary invades my ordinary. His extraordinary invades my ordinary. God is very good at injecting something supernatural and extraordinary right into the middle of something that seems completely mundane and ordinary. And if you, if you read the Bible, you see it over and over again. In the very beginning, there's like a watery ball that is chaotic and formless, and God speaks, and the extraordinary reality of life and light bursts out onto the canvas of creation, and he just does it. 
It's extraordinary because he says it is and he brings it. It invades the ordinary. There's a story in the Exodus of of the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt on the run and then they find themselves in front of a very ordinary bottle uh, bottle of water, body of water, and that body of water, an extraordinary wind. If you read that story, it's not like God snaps his fingers and makes it happen. It said the wind blows. An extraordinary wind comes along and parts that sea so they can walk across. And then you go, you know, a couple, you know, 1,400 years after the Red Seas parted, and you go to a little stable in a podunk town called Bethlehem, and all of a sudden, bam, the king of heaven and earth, the God of the universe, is born in a human body. And the shepherds who are on the hillside watching their dirty sheep, all of a sudden the sky breaks open, and angels are singing a chorus announcing good news to the entire human race. It's like something very mundane, very ordinary, and God just injects, God invades with something that is extraordinary. And that's what Jesus is going to do in this situation right here. I want you to see three extraordinary things that he does. First, he uses ordinary pots for an extraordinary purpose. Look at verse 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. So these are these giant stone repositories that are meant to hold water so that people can wash themselves according to the ceremonial cleansing rites of the Jewish faith. And Jesus commandeers these stone pots, and he is going to use them for a very unconventional and a very unexpected purpose. I can guarantee you before this point, those things had never been filled with anything but water, and especially not some choice wine. But Jesus is doing the extraordinary right in the middle of the ordinary. And if you're, if you're a student of the Bible and you follow the themes of the Bible, you'll also know that Jesus is very subtly foreshadowing the fact that as he fills these purification jars with water, he's, he's giving you a little glimpse of the fact that in not so much time, he himself, by the shedding of his blood, which he pictures as wine later in his life, is going to completely fulfill and then replace the entire purification system. Jesus doesn't say it overtly. It's very subtle in this miracle, but you can kind of, you can hear the echo if you know the scriptures. Jesus is saying all of these, all of this ceremonial cleansing and all of the washing that you have to do to be right with God, soon my blood is going to cover all of that and make it, make it right once and for all. He uses ordinary pots for an extraordinary purpose. Then he uses, he turns ordinary water into extraordinary wine. Verse 7, he tells them to fill the pots. And then verse 8, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Now, at some point in here, the water that was drawn out of the well, somewhere in verses 7 or 8, the water became wine. And it's very, it's like very under wraps. Jesus doesn't stand up and go, let there be wine. He doesn't like wave a wand or snap his fingers or sing a song, say an incantation. He doesn't do any of that. Just out of nowhere, the water that was drawn out all of a sudden is wine. (laughs) My little boy Titus yesterday, when I watched him do this, I was like, you cannot make this stuff up. He's been really into playing, um, he he plays like imaginary uh, boxes and toys. Like he'll play these imaginary games. So he looked over at my wife, Rachel. We were both sitting in the living room and he goes, mom, box. And he points to the ground where there is no box. And she goes, she goes, what's in the box? And he goes, scissors. And he cuts, he's cutting open the box and he opens the box and then he reaches his hands in and he goes like this, like he's got something in his hands and he starts walking over to Rachel. So she puts her hands out like this and he goes, And she goes, what is it? And he like stops and thinks for a second and then he goes, soup. (laughs) He just puts soup in her hands. So I'm sitting right next to Rachel and I go, I go, Titus, who made the soup? And he goes, God. (laughs) God made the soup. (laughs) And I thought it was so awesome. I was like, are you, are you peeking in on my sermon prep? Because, because God made the wine. 
Like there was, there was nothing there that would have constituted wine to be present. But Jesus exer- exercises his supernatural authority over the created order. And all of a sudden there's wine where there was water before. And Jesus completely skips the entire process that it normally takes to make wine. No vines, no seeds, no soil, no sunlight, no nothing. There's just wine. And it's really good wine. Let's just be honest with ourselves for a second. How awesome is it that Jesus' first miracle is to bring drinks to a party so it can go longer? That's awesome. Jesus loves weddings and he loves parties and he loves joy. Wine in this time was a symbol of joy and celebration. And Jesus is saying, here's my blessing so you can carry on the party. Here's the wine. It's so awesome. Now, Christians get weird when you talk about alcohol. Here's the facts of the matter. The Bible nowhere ever condemns the consumption of alcohol. Though Christians have made that, um, they've made that a high priority at different times in church history. The Bible never condemns the drinking of alcohol. And if you come from a super conservative background, sometimes the Bible even commends the drinking of alcohol. You're reading Paul, he's writing to Timothy and he's like, hey, if your stomach is sick, drink a little wine. (laughs) And then you've got Jesus here. Like, I don't know what you're supposed to make of this if you're, if you're on, like, the teetotaler program. The Bible never says you can't drink wine. The Bible says you, you, you can't drink. It, it never says you can't drink alcohol. What it does say is you should not be drunk, that that's sin. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So, Alcohol, just like anything else in the common grace of God, is meant to be enjoyed with discernment and wisdom by God's people without slipping over the boundary into what is clearly sin because because God said so. Jesus brings wine to the party so these people can keep celebrating. He turns ordinary water into extraordinary wine. And then the last extraordinary thing he does, he makes ordinary problems into extraordinary provision. Ordinary problems. Now, the wine runs out at this party, and in our day and age, that wouldn't be such a big deal. If you were at the wedding and you saw the wine running dry, you'd be like, send somebody to Costco and buy like 50 of those little boxes that they sell wine in. Just go, go, go get some. But you could not do this at this time. In fact, the groom who was single-handedly responsible for preparing this wedding party. And this, the wedding parties in the first century at times could have lasted up to a week. This was like a lifetime event that the groom was responsible to prepare for, to get all the supplies for, to make everything ready. And in fact, his preparation for the wedding feast was supposed to be indicative of his ability to provide for his wife and his new family. And so you can imagine at the moment that the party's supposed to still be going and the wine runs dry, the shame and embarrassment that would be heaped upon this groom. It would be way, way further than what we think of as like a faux pas at a party where we accidentally ran out of sparkling waters or something. This would be like social stigma, like he wasn't good enough to care for his wife. That's the, that's the problem that he is facing. But what's so awesome here is that instead of getting shame, maybe the shame that he rightfully deserved for his lack of preparation, because of the ministry of Jesus, he actually gets glory. He gets like some props here. Watch what happens. Verse 9, when the master of the feast, that guy's like the MC. He's kind of the maitre d' who's overseeing the, the wedding ceremony. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine but you kept the good wine until now. The MC goes to the groom who would be the one responsible to get all the wine and the wine that he tastes is so good. He says, everyone, I mean like the normal way of doing it is you serve, you serve the, the lower quality stuff, like you serve the two buck chuck from Trader Joe's at the beginning or, or you serve that at the end because people have had enough to drink that they can't really taste it anyways. That's what he's saying. He's like, but you, you saved the best for last. You saved the best wine for last. I think, this, I think that's so incredible because this, this is such a low-key miracle. Jesus doesn't do it uh, in public. He doesn't do it in a flashy way. And he intentionally does not do it in a way that everyone will see it and recognize it. 
he only does it in a way that a few will recognize it. Sometimes God works in extraordinary ways and you don't even know it. You're not aware of it. Sometimes God works for you. God works in your life in extraordinary ways and you don't even have the eyes to see it. Think about this for a second, that the one who benefits the most from this miracle is entirely unaware that it happened. The groom who would bear the embarrassment and the shame of lack of preparation is spared the shame by the miracle of Jesus and he didn't even know that he did it. And how many times has God rescued us from shame, from consequences, from things that should have happened to us with his extraordinary power and we were unaware the whole time that he was protecting us and preserving us and caring for us and leading us. This is what Jesus is doing here. He's caring for this young man and he has no idea it's even happening. So sometimes God works and you don't see it and sometimes God works and you're the only one who sees it. They're at this wedding feast, and apparently it is a very small minority that even knows Jesus did something. It's apparently Mary, his like little handful of followers, and however many servants filled the jars. Those are the only people who are even aware that a miracle occurred. It, just imagine, we, we don't get to know, the Bible doesn't tell us what the reaction of the servants was. But imagine being the servants who took these giant pots, filled them with water, and then when you scooped it out to go take it to the master, it's wine. And you kind of hand it to the master and Im imagine the servants just standing there like looking at the master and he drinks it and he's like, this wine is amazing. And this dude knows he just drew water. And he's looking at Jesus and he's looking at the wine. He's looking at Jesus. He's like... And he's looking at the guests like, does anybody else know what just happened? <laughs> it's probably a good thing I was not in that situation. I'm a total loudmouth. I would have been like, he did it. He made the wine. Does everyone know he just did that? Because that was awesome. We don't get told what exactly happened. But imagine the dumbstruck awe that these servants were. Was, imagine what was resting on them. Imagine who they told after. Imagine how they told them. What happened at this party? Here's the question I think we need to take from this. Do we have eyes to see and a heart to celebrate the extraordinary things that God does in our ordinary lives? Because you and I, we have, we have very ordinary lives. We have uh, you know, a schedule, we have a routine, we have work, we have relationships, and oftentimes it feels very mundane and very humdrum and very one thing after the other. But if we will stop and see for a second with eyes of faith, we can see regularly the extraordinary things that God is doing in our lives. Just yesterday, I have to share the story with you, just yesterday, we went to the Korean church that is three houses down from our Camelback building. And that's where our servant teams met before we went out to serve the city. We met at the Korean church. And yesterday, the, the pastor's wife, that Korean church, she shared with some of our team that in 1997, 24 years ago, she had a vision. She felt like she received a vision from God of the building that we are in becoming a church, and she said specifically in her vision, she saw young people flowing in and out of the church and it being like a hive of activity and her being thankful to the Lord for what he was doing like, like right in their next door neighbors. That was 1997. Then she says, I had the vision again. She said, I didn't think about it. I didn't even remember it until I had the vision again just recently. And just a couple weeks after she had the vision again, after a 24-year interval, construction fencing goes up around the building and a sign gets slapped up that says Christ Church. And we start showing up in the neighborhood to have community groups and to meet with people and to serve. And the building's getting built out to be a worship center that young people will flow in and out of. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is so mundane. It's so ordinary. It's this little old Korean lady. And God is showing up and showing off in extraordinary ways in her life. And if you have eyes to see it, he's doing the same thing in your life. Maybe you've never had a vision. Maybe you've never had something that feels miraculous. But if you know Jesus, if you've been rescued from the penalty of your sin and you've been made alive by faith, that's miraculous. 
That is extraordinary gospel power in your life to wake you up from the dead. And if you have the eyes to see it and the heart to celebrate it, you can see extraordinary things that God is doing in your ordinary life. And if you see, if you see the glorious power of Jesus, you will also see his extraordinary work in your ordinary life. That's how your life will change. And then the third and last way, just quickly, the third life change is this. His mission demands my movement. His mission demands my movement. Look at verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. You can always tell in an airport uh, what kind of agenda somebody is on by how they are walking. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? Like one time I was traveling back from India and I got stuck in an airport for like six or eight hours and I couldn't leave the airport because I would have to clear customs. So I just had to sit in this airport and wait. And I had no internet on my phone. I had no nothing. So I just literally, I just mindlessly meandered this airport for like five hours. And I just investigated every nook and cranny, but I didn't look like I was going anywhere because I wasn't going anywhere. I was just stuck waiting. And then other times I've uh, got to the airport irresponsibly late or landed on a connecting flight and I have like four minutes to get to my gate and it's like, if you're at Sky Harbor, it's like six miles away and so you're just hoofing it as fast as you can to get there. Jesus here in the, at the end of this story, he is not mindlessly meandering. He's not in a rush, he's not frantic, he's not late but he's going somewhere on purpose. He's got somewhere to be and something to get done. So here's what he does. The text says that the first of his signs, he manifested his glory. Jesus made visible the beauty and the power of God himself. He made it He made it visible and tangible to the people around him. He manifested his glory. And then it says he moved on to the next city. And this is going to become like the pattern of Jesus' life and ministry. He's going to roll into a town. He's going to teach with authority, proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick of their diseases, and then he's up and gone to the next town because he's got a mission. He is on earth to get something done. And he knows in order to accomplish it, he has to move from one place to the next, reaching people and teaching people and healing and proclaiming the kingdom. And what I love about this, I love the response of the disciples and the family. If you see it there in 11 and 12, the disciples believe in him and his family follows him. The example of his disciples and of his family should be a challenge to us because though Jesus is not bodily present on the earth anymore, he no less is still manifesting his glory and moving in the world. And the question is, are we going to believe him and follow him? His disciples saw his miraculous power. They saw who he was. They saw what he could do, and they put their faith and their trust in him. And then they followed him. They said, wherever he's going, we're going. Whatever mission he's on, we're going on. Whatever his agenda is, that's our agenda now. They follow him. I'm so thankful that there are people sitting in this room who not so many months ago sold their homes in other places of the city, other parts of the city, and they moved here to Central Phoenix to see this church planted and to see the mission of Christ go forward. And it's because they were like these disciples and they were like this family. They saw the glorious power of Jesus and it had so changed their lives that they were moving because of the mission. They were compelled to go with Jesus wherever he was going. And that is the mark of those who have truly seen the glorious power of Jesus. The mission becomes not just another item on the to-do list. The mission is the to-do list. The mission to glorify Jesus and see disciples made to the ends of the earth, that is not something in my life or an aspect of my life. It is my life. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be constrained and compelled by the mission of Jesus. Every decision, every interaction, every relationship, every opportunity is a platform for you to 
represent Jesus and live on the mission of Jesus. For those who recognize the glory of Jesus' power, life changes. Not just things about my life, but life itself. All of my priorities are shaped by his authority. All of my ordinary is now no longer that ordinary because he is doing extraordinary things and my movement is compelled by his mission. Here's a, a charge for learning to live this week. Three things. Look at Jesus, depend on Jesus, and go with Jesus. Maybe jot these down. Maybe talk to a friend about how these play out in your life. First, look at Jesus. Whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, you and I, what we need to do is fix our gaze on the author and perfecter of our faith. That's Jesus. Look at him. And if you feel like you have grown numb and distant to his glory and to his power, get alone with the scriptures and in prayer and just look at him until you sense it again. Ask the Holy Spirit to soften your heart and to open your eyes so you can see him for who he is. And if you've never followed him, if you don't know him, spend time in the scriptures, in the gospel of John, looking at Jesus. See him, see who he is and what he says and what he does and believe in him like the disciples believed in him. Number two is depend on Jesus. Jesus has everything that you need. He has all the power and the purpose and the grace. He has all the mercy that you are longing for and looking for. Run to him and depend on him. You will find him to be sufficient. And then number three, go with Jesus. Jesus is still on mission in the world today. He's still saving people. He's still moving from town to town because there are those of his sheep that are scattered that he wants to reconcile to himself, that he wants to gather. And his primary instrument for doing that now is you and me in the power of the Spirit on the mission of Jesus. So how can you go with Jesus? Who needs to hear about him? Who needs to be loved in his name? Who needs to have needs met by you because you know Jesus? I'll close with this. The setting for Jesus' first miracle, I love it so much, the setting for his first miracle is a wedding feast. It's a time of joy and celebration. But did you know that one of the settings for one of Jesus' final scenes in the entire Bible is also a wedding feast? But this time, instead of the bride and the groom being an unnamed young Middle Eastern couple celebrating their wedding, this time at the wedding feast of the lamb, the bride and the groom are Jesus Christ himself and his bride, all of his redeemed people. And the reason it's called the wedding feast of the lamb is because it is the spotless lamb that spills its blood to cleanse the bride and make us right, make us fit for the day when we will see our Savior face to face and worship him for eternity. And that's what we celebrate in communion. We, we celebrate the shed blood of Jesus. On the night before he was betrayed, Jesus sat down to a Passover meal with his disciples and he took bread and he said, this is my body and it will be broken. And he took a cup of wine and he said, this is my blood which will be shed as the symbol and the seal of the new covenant that I am making between God and men. It is the consummation of all of history that the redeemed people who have been washed by the blood of Jesus will celebrate with him at his wedding feast once and for all, where every tear will be wiped away and every sorrow will be undone in the presence of our Savior and our King. And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate communion. We're going to take communion in just a minute, but before we do, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for showing us who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in your word. And thank you for your provision, your kindness, and your grace. God, thank you for your miraculous, your extraordinary, your supernatural power. God, I pray that in this moment where we celebrate communion, God, that you would minister to our hearts again, that we would see that the primary expression of your power is your ability to save sinners through the blood of your son. So God, we pray again that we would see the severity of our sin, 
and we would see the wonder of the cross and we would be, we would be broken again by the fact that it was our sin that put him on the cross, that it was our guilt that required his blood to cleanse. And then God, I pray that we would be moved to worship again the lamb who was slain, the lion who is conquered, our King Jesus who is worthy. We pray this in his name. Amen.